out of the ministry, and it was, it was kind of eye-opening for me to read that article. And, and what it was talking about is pastors are so accessible today than they've ever been before. Because we have these cell phones, and, and their morning starts. And really, the guy that wrote this was a pastor himself, and he said his day starts, he gets a text from somebody, and, you know, they have a problem, they struggle with sin in their life. Later on, he hears from somebody else who's having trouble with their marriage, or somebody's sick, and, and it's all day that they hear this, and they're so accessible. They know about everybody's life, and, and, and of course, they want to know, and they want to do that. That's part of being a pastor. I'm not saying that, but uh, after a while, it can't weigh on them. Many of them burn out, and they get out of the uh, profession, and they do something different. And so it's good to let our pastor get away every now and then, just kind of clear so off. It's going to take a few days, and... Uh, so I appreciate Brother Reuben. He is a, a, a true preacher. Uh, you know, he does a good, a good job here. When he goes and preaches over the Bible, he settles out with you. Amen? And so uh, who knows tell him what I can do if I can get somebody to call me to do a revival. Amen? <laughs> yeah. It's good to be here. I, uh, we need to remember Brother Jay. I believe he's going to be leaving over to Peru. If y'all remember him when he went to Kenya uh, a couple of months ago, but, uh, I had a dream. Y'all remember that dream? Yeah, I'm not going to go over it again. But uh, I have not had a dream pertaining to this trip to Peru yet. So, uh, but Jay, if, if I do, I'll let you know about it. Amen. So, uh, anyway, if we need to pray for him. That's a big deal when they're gone and sharing the gospel. We appreciate what he does in representing our church and the mission. Amen. All right, this morning, uh, if you have a comment, we're going to look at Psalms 137. Psalms 137. Uh, I'd like to say this before we we get into the reading of it. If you were to ask a lot of folks what is their favorite book of the Bible, a lot of people will say the book of Psalms. The reason so is it's pretty easy reading, right? Uh, we can read Psalms. A lot of the chapters are real short. We can read a whole chapter really easy sometimes. A lot of the verses are uplifting and encouraging us. Uh, as we all know, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And then my favorite Psalm is Psalm 46. Uh, and so uh, it talks about we won't fear you know, that God's in control. And so, uh, this morning, uh, we're going to look at Psalms. This Psalm this morning, though, is a little different. And it's not uh, an encouraging Psalm at all. In fact, it may be a Psalm more of a warning in, in, in how it uh, speaks to us today. So, Psalms 137, if you have it in your Bibles, if you would stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read the first four verses there. It says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yet we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our hearts upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there are they that carried us away captive, required of us a song. They that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. In verse 4, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Father, I pray you bless the reading of your word. I pray you would help us this morning, God. You would speak to us what we need to say. The Lord, just bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I went into my office Friday night, and I always try to go over my sermon, just like I was doing on Sunday morning, just to see how long it would take, and kind of get more, more familiar with it. And 22 minutes later, I was done. And so I come out, and I told Sherry, I said, that's that nice, 22 minutes. Usually I forget half of what I want to say. So I guess we'll be here about 11 minutes this morning. <laughs> so, so pressure this morning. It, it is a, a short time, but I believe it's one God's laid on my heart. Really, I've, I've never heard this scripture preached. And as I was reading it, it kind of spoke to me. Uh, so I hope we can get it out the way God can give it to us. First, I'd like to mention that there's two cities that were mentioned in the text this morning. Zion is the first, text, uh, first city that was mentioned. And we need to define that this morning. Zion is known as the city of David. It's a hill there in Jerusalem. And it was a place that they worshipped God. It was the temple was where they came. They worshipped was known as the city of David. In fact, in 1 Kings uh, 8, it says, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, and the king Solomon in Jerusalem. They might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord, out of the city of David, which is Zion. Second Samuel refers, it says, Nevertheless, David took stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. So this mount there was the highest place in Jerusalem. It was known as the city of David. It was known as Zion. 
Zion is reference to the Bible as the holiest place, the place where uh, people worship God, where they came and met with God, where God was uh, actually dwelt there in Zion. We've heard songs about Zion. We've always, I've always heard that. It's mentioned many times in the book of Psalms. It's mentioned even more in the book of Isaiah. In fact, uh, a lot of times it's mentioned as the daughters of Zion, which is a metaphor that is talking about the relationship between uh, Jerusalem and God. That's the kind of relationship they had. So Zion represents the place where God was at. It represents the holiest place in the whole world. It's Mount Zion. Okay? And so in our lives, Zion represents that place where we met God. That place where we've been closer to God than at any other time in our life. And I don't know about you, I can remember some uh, services that we've had where it seemed like the very presence of God was here with us. We've had some revivals. In fact, we've had a, re had a revival uh, about three years ago. Brother Jeremy Pruitt came, the 11th hour came and did the singing. And man, we had revival, if you remember that. The Spirit of God moved in our church and in the hearts and lives of people. We had a lot of people get saved that week. Uh, I surrendered to preach that week uh, openly. And so uh, there's some times that we can remember uh, when we were closest to God. I don't know about you, but just think back this morning, if you would, to, to that place and time you were at that you seemed like you were in the very presence of Almighty God. Maybe it was at Antioch. Maybe it was at another church. Maybe you were all alone somewhere in your home or wherever. Uh, maybe I think about a lot of our church camps. I think about a camp we had a few years ago over at Mississippi College. And I'll just set the stage a little bit. When we go to church camp, you have church every night, of course. But after that, you go and you meet with your group. It's called church group devotion. It's just you and your kids and your adults that came with you. And you get along somewhere. And I've been to a lot of camps. I, I've lost count of how many I've been to. But always they would put you in a classroom somewhere uh, that night where you could just feel on. You could just talk to your kids. A lot of times that's where decisions were made, where kids would get saved, where, where kids would open up and talk about what's going on in their life and in their family and all that. It's a great time. My favorite part of camp by far is church group devotion. But that year, for some reason, they didn't have us in a room. Uh, we didn't have any. We, we tried meeting in one place outside and it didn't work out. Uh, too noisy, too many people, too many people. The Bible churches were just. They have prayer with their kids and let them go. They'd be playing and cutting up. But I always try to use that time to, to really uh, pour into my kids. And so uh, every night we would try a different place. And it just wasn't working out. I'd go back to the staff and say, look, why can't y'all put us in a room? Well, for some reason, the college didn't want us doing that. And so finally, I don't know if it was the last night or the night before the last one, but we went out to a secluded part of the campus there. Real pretty campus, the grass was cut up, everything was neat, and they had big benches and they had sidewalks. And I said, We're just going to meet right here. And it, it was kind of off the big path or north the big path. And I told my kids, I said, Y'all pair up in the groups of two. Just, just go in pairs of two. And I said, When you get there, y'all look each other in the eye and say, Are you saved? Do you know you're saved? And all that. Y'all talk about that. And I said, I'll be coming. It may take a little while. And I'll be coming. And I'm going to come by. I'm going to meet with y'all. I'm going to pray with y'all. And so we did that. I left my adults there. They were praying for us. And so I went to my first prayer, met the girls. And uh, as soon as I got there, one of them said, Dejo, I need, I need to get saved. And so I led her to the Lord. And we prayed. The other girl knew she was saved. And so I said, don't be saying tight. Don't just talk. Whatever. Just be real. So I went to the next prayer. And one of them said, I got I to get saved. I'm not saved. So I led them to the Lord. I went to another group. My son was in that group. And he said, Dejo, I need to get saved. And so I led him to the Lord, which was a special deal. And before it was over, I led six of our kids to the Lord that night. And I think back about that, and I, I think if we'd been in the classroom, that wouldn't have happened. They wouldn't have got along. See, they didn't know other kids were making decisions all over the campus. A lot of times, you get to, you know, they'll see somebody go down and say, well, they got to go down too. They may do it because somebody else did. But that night, nobody knew they were doing it. And six of them got saved. And I can think back about that time. That's, that's not time to me. That's, that's being in the presence of God right there on that little campus. And it was just a neat little place to be. I'll never forget it because to me that represents what God is right? And hopefully there's a time in your life, if you know Jesus this morning, you've been born again, there's a Mount Zion in your life. There's a place that you can go back to. And even after we're saved, we can have some experiences with God that we can call Mount Zion. There's another city that was mentioned in the text. And that's Babylon. Babylon... Today is located where Baghdad is in Iraq. And 
biblical times, the back uh, Babylon was a bad place. And it was never mentioned in a good good place uh, in the Bible. Let's get the drink. <coughs> so today we know Iraq is still a bad place, right? It's not known for anything good, nothing good comes out of Iraq. And so Babylon in that day was a bad place. Now the Israelites found themselves in Babylon. The reason they were there, they had been taken over by the Babylonians. They had been exiled out because of their sin, because of what they had done. They had turned their back on Almighty God. And God allowed the Babylonians to come in and to take them away. And so here they are in this place that is not home to them. Okay? Now, that's a long ways from Jerusalem to Babylon. It's close to 1,700 miles. So they got there, and in this scripture here, the reason they're there again is because of their sin and idolatry. And I would say this morning that idolatry is rampant in America today. I could preach a whole sermon on the sins, the idols that we worship and serve, and the things that we do that we shouldn't do. So one of the big idols that I would like to mention this morning, though, if I could just chase a squirrel. I know Brother Ruben, he runs rabbits. I'm going to chase a squirrel if I can. Uh, it's our cell phones. Our cell phones are a big idol. People are constantly on our cell phones. I'm guilty too. And we spend much more time on them than we do at God's work. And that can be an idol. It can be anything that we do more than we uh, do with God, it's an idol. And so uh, we have to be careful of that. There's some good things on our cell phones. We can get Bible apps and devotions. I have all that, but uh, it can be some bad things too, you know? and we can do a lot of things, we've got, we got all these uh, places to go, Facebook can be good, and it can be bad. I don't know if y'all remember Brother Jeff, but Ruben's pastor, but remember what he said about Facebook, he referred to the, the writing in the bathroom wall of the truck stop, you know? and it can be that way. I, I don't get on it, I've never been on it, but every now and then somebody will read something somewhere, and, you know, you get in a fight on there and start putting all this stuff, and it can get out of hand real quick. And so, these phones uh, can be an idol to us this morning. Well, I see some throat stuff up here. I'm going to have to get it. I'm going to pray for me. <coughs> Clear up here. But Babylon was representing in our lives the sin, the place that we uh, get away from God. We stray away from God when we're living uh, the way we shouldn't live. Okay? So we've been to Zion, we've been born again, we find ourselves in Zion. So what are the uh, effects of being in Zion or, or leaving Zion to go to Babylon? What are the effects of that? What, what does that cause in our life? I think the first, <clears throat> the first effect is the fact that we lose our joy makes us sad. If you look at verse 1, it says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sit down and we wept when we remember God. So in our lives today, when we live in sin, and we get away from God, when we remember where we come from, it makes us sad. Amen. It can, it can bring us down. It can steal our joy. And so the effect of leaving Zion and going to Babylon be that we're sad. And if we're not, it means we're lost. Amen. If you're a Christian, <coughs> you're not going to stay out of God's will very long. He's going to call you back. And you're going to have to come back to it. And I've been there before. So I know that. And so if we, if we can live in sin and it doesn't bother us and we just continue and continue, then we've never been designed in the first place. Amen. And so the effects of living in Babylon is fact we get homesick. It says that they wept when they remembered Zion. They wept. I don't know if you ever come to a place in your life and you sin that you wept and you cried out to God uh, because you felt guilty and bad about your sin and you wanted to come back to him. They also were sad and they wept because they were homesick. I don't know if you've ever been homesick or not, but I have. I'm, I haven't traveled very much, but I remember when I was uh, just a young boy, 18, 19 years old, we went to work. I worked with Tracy and we worked with New Orleans down there for a couple of weeks. And I got homesick. And I called Scott, my brother, I said, come get me. And he said, I'm not coming to New Orleans. I said, you come down here and get me right now. He said, I ain't driving all the way to New Orleans. You're about to tough enough. You'll be home in a few days. And just 
get over it. Amen. So I had to do that. I never did forgive him for doing that. <laughs> I remember some of the kids at camp, especially when Kay and Ann and I used to take the junior youth to camp, some of those boys would get homesick. They'd be fine, but back then all the kids didn't have a cell phone. I had a cell phone. They would be my phone and call home. And some of those big old boys, they were bigger than I was, but they were young. They'd get on the phone with their mamas and they'd get swallowed. Now, I mean, they just go on carrying on. I'd get on the phone with their mama and they say, I'm coming to get so and so. I said, No, he's not. He's only, well, he's awful upset. I said, Yeah, but he only gets upset when he gets on the phone. I said, He's already gone right now, playing and talking, laughing. I said, He's fine. You're not going to get it, you know. The fact that just hear mama's voice or daddy's voice, it made them homesick. And that's what these folks were talking about here. As they sat on the bank of the river, and they remembered Zion. They remember where they were from. They wept because of their sin, because they were homesick. <laughs> the second effect of leaving Zion is it makes us want to quit serving God. <clears throat> Verse 2 it says, We hang our hearts upon the willows in the midst thereof. We hang our hearts. I think we've all heard the saying, so and so hung it up, so and so put the football team or whatever, they hung it up, right? When I read that, that's what I'm talking about. They hung up their heart. They couldn't play their instruments anymore. They lost their joy. They're in the bank of that river. They said, hung them up. They said, we can't play our music anymore. We can't play our song. And that's what sin will do to us in our lives. It can cause us to want to just quit. Quit serving God. Quit teaching Sunday school. Quit helping with Bible school. Quit serving this committee or that committee. Why? Because we have sin in our lives. Just pure old black, rotten sin that deprives us of that joy of serving God. It's that sin that separates us from God. And we can't serve no more. We have to quit because we can't keep doing what we've been doing. Sin separates us from Holy God. He cannot be in the presence of sin. So when we sin, we're separated. We lose our joy. We don't want to play the, our music anymore. We don't want to do the things that, <coughs> that He's called us to do. I never was musically talented. <clears throat> Although it does run in my family, and some of my brothers, and even my dad played guitar, mother Monica, and things like that. I remember as a boy, Brother Joe Cannon was our pastor. I believe it's his brother in law, Brother Ed Jeff, was also a preacher. Uh, my mama took a big meal back then. The preachers ate a lot of families back then. So we had a big meal at our home. Brother Joe and his family came, Brother Ed. We gathered around after we eat. My dad was playing guitar. Bruce and Scott were playing guitar. There may have been a keyboard there. Jenny could play the piano. And we had a harmonica going. Singing, singing hymns, you know. And I remember when they got through with one of the songs, Brother Ed looked at me and he said, David, uh, what do you play? And I said, baseball. <laughs> I could play. I couldn't sing a lot. I couldn't sing. I couldn't do anything like that. But baseball was my my thing, and so I told them baseball. They always joke with me about that over the years, but uh, playing those musical instruments, you think about that, and, and just uh, worship the Lord. But when we have sin in our lives, we can't do it anymore. It makes us want to quit. The last thing I want to look at this morning that we lose when we go to Babylon is we lose our song. It says there in verse 4, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? <laughs> These people that have them captive, they, they have them to sing a song. They say, how, how can we sing a song? How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange way? We have sin in our lives, we lose our song. We can lose our song. I want us to be clear this morning. It's not the, it's not the pressures of life, life itself that beats us up, that makes us lose our song. It's not a death in the family, or hearing the doctor say you have cancer, or having trouble with a teenager. Those things don't make us lose our song. It's just pure old sin that causes us to not be able to sing to the Lord. You see, Paul and Silas had been arrested. They had they were in the town preaching. They come across a girl that was possessed. <clears throat> there was men there that used this girl to make money. She could prophesy. She could tell the future. She was demon possessed. And they cast this demon out. And they did that. And these men saw that they wouldn't be able to make any more money. Usually they struggle to do that. So they had them arrested and put in jail. The Bible says they were beaten up. They 
receives the penis strike from her back and put him in jail. <coughs> About seven at midnight, we're there in jail, and our feet were locked up with chains. They began to pray, they began to praise God, they began to sing hymns in jail at night. It's a day of the mystery. They could very easily so we didn't, we lost our song. They didn't lose their song. Life had been, none of us had been through what they went through that night. They still had their song. So listen, even though life can be tough and it can be hard, we still have a song. The only thing that can steal your song this morning is your sin. So if you've been to Zion, you've experienced God's grace, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you're here this morning, you've been to Zion, but you find yourself in Babylon, then you need to head back. You need to go back. And that's the good thing about God. He takes us back. His love, His grace, His forgiveness is something I couldn't explain this morning. But I've experienced it. And it's awesome. God can restore, He can forgive. We think about David this morning. David had lost his joy. He had lost his song because of his sin. Because he had committed adultery. Because he had committed murder to try to cover that. Psalms 51, we see where he cries out, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. There's folks here this morning that just need to cry out to the Lord this today. So God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Where are you at today? Are you in Zion? Or are you in Babylon? I can't doubt the thing preach this message about the prodigal son. He left his tail, he left his father and his family. He had it made right there. When he had got in his heritage, he went out to the Bible city and lived in Rises City. He went to a strange land. He went to a foreign country. He lived in sin. He spent all his money. There was a famine. Things got hard. He said, you know what? I'm just going to go back. I know I'm going to be a son before. I'm just going to go back to the higher circle. And so he went back home. The Bible says his father was on the porch. And he saw his son coming a long way up. And he ran. And he hugged him and kissed him on the cheek. Weapon in home with his arm broken wide. And that's exactly the picture we need to see this morning of Almighty God. No matter where you're at in your life today, He's standing with his arm broken wide. He loves you. He'll forgive you. Not only did He forgive His Son that day, He thought a big party for Him. And that's exactly what God did for us. Amen. Last little rock comes. The band.